One of Persona 3's most beloved characters, Aegis, underwent some of the most drastic and hard-hitting character arcs in the series by far. The amount of pain and growth she had to go through is staggering, and she's one of the most well-written characters in the series in my opinion, maybe even more so than the Persona 3 protagonist himself. In this video, I'll be going over Aegis' growth as a character, and just like the Makoto analysis, I'll also be giving additional context by going into the reasoning and mythology of her Persona choices. We'll be going over Persona 3's The Journey and The Answer. I won't be going over Persona 4 Arena or Ultimax in this video because while these do show some great moments for her, her character arc is more or less complete by the end of The Answer, so it's a bit redundant to go any further than that for her. Also, like the Makoto analysis, I'll be using the movies and the games as a reference since they both do a good job of developing her as a character. There's a lot to cover and I don't want to waste any of your time, so let's get into the background of Aegis. Aegis is a 7th generation anti-shadow suppression weapon created by the Kirijo group with the sole intent to… well, destroy shadows, who would have guessed? She is one of the last of their kind remaining besides Labras, but she's mentioned way later on in Persona 4 Arena. These machines have something called a personality module to give themselves a sense of self, since that's what the power of Persona relies on. They also have plumes of dusk inside of the personality modules, which while serving various functions, act as ways to allow them to function during the dark hour and give them their psyche. Despite having a sense of self and a persona, I guess in her first appearances is very robotic, as you would probably expect. She does still have care for the members of Cease, she just doesn't quite understand things like the human psyche or feelings all that well. Despite this, there is one clear thing, and it's that she has a very high affinity for Makoto, the protagonist. No one, including Igus herself, is aware of the reason why at first, but in retrospect we know that 10 years ago on Moonlight Bridge, she sealed death inside of Makoto. All she knows is that Makoto is very important to her for some reason she cannot explain. In fact, Makoto was so important to her that she reactivated herself 10 years after the initial battle against death just to be by his side again. Not so much of a robotic motive to do so, wouldn't you say? In terms of Igus's appearance, she is very humanoid despite being a machine, and this was chosen for her and other anti-shadow suppression weapons because it helps them to think and act more human-like, which in turn improves their power of persona as well. She has beautiful blonde hair and blue eyes, and she blends in well at school because of these characteristics. Similarly to Makoto in the early stages of Persona 3, Igus simply follows orders and does them to the best of her ability. Really, when you think about it, Makoto and Igus are very similar. Both start more or less emotionless, and both follow orders without asking questions. Their personalities are pretty different, but even then they still have some similarities. Neither of them understand the complexity of the human nature, psyche, or feelings like I mentioned a moment before, so they grow together in this aspect. I don't want to get too ahead of myself here, but this will be elaborated upon throughout this analysis. One last detail to go over for Igus before moving on is her arcana, which is the Eon. The Eon is an interesting one because it's one of few in Persona 3 that aren't a part of the 22 major arcana, but in most depictions, it serves the same role as the Judgment Arcana, which is seen as finding one's calling in life, gaining better understanding of life, and acceptance. The only other Eon character in the series is Marie from Persona 4 Golden, which makes sense as the two share similar struggles. The Eon represents Igus' main struggles throughout the game with her nature as a machine and her eventual growth to become more human. Okay, I believe that's enough about Igus' backstory, but unlike Makoto, she already has her persona, so I feel it's important to go ahead and give some insight about it. Her first tier persona is Palladian, which is a Greek and Roman term that refers to an image of great antiquity that a city or nation depends on. Some examples of this are Troy and Rome. She was seen as a protector of many cities in Greece, and this aspect of Palladian can represent some important aspects of Aegis. The first being her immense desire to be by Makoto's side and protect him, and the second is her desire over time to protect all of Cease. This aspect is very important to her character, and is demonstrated several times over throughout the narrative. Palladian's design in Persona 3 is very robotic and mechanical, which represents what I mentioned earlier about Aegis's robotic, logical, and literal nature. She dons the mask of a human wearing armor and a dress, but the main guts when you get down to it are just machinery with the intent to deal damage to the shadows she's been assigned to exterminate. Interestingly, despite the fact that Igus herself is designated to the Eon Arcana, Palladian itself is a part of the Chariot Arcana. The Chariot Arcana is typically seen along the lines of a symbol of victory, willpower, a strong desire to succeed, conquest, and things of that nature. Personas of this Arcana are typically experts in physical attacks and weaker in magic which is a perfect description of Palladian. She has no magic skills whatsoever, and the only SP skills she holds are support and debuff ones. More importantly though, this Arcana can accurately describe Aegis alongside the Eon. 
Despite being unfamiliar with the world, people, and all the aforementioned things, she has an unyielding desire to fight and won't back down from the objective or enemy in front of her. A great example of this is when she initially fought Death on Moonlight Bridge. There was absolutely zero chance she was going to defeat him, but her stubbornness and determination to carry out her task led her to sealing him inside of Makoto. Regardless of the circumstances, she will try to do her best to do what needs to be done. Okay, with all of this information on Aegis and her persona, we can finally get into the actual events of the game. Her first appearance in the game is on July 21st, and this is the day she reactivated herself, 10 years after the incident on Moonlight Bridge as previously mentioned. The very first thing she does is seek out Makoto, and once she finds him and has a chance, she says, My highest priority is to be at your side. She joins Cease and is immediately valued amongst the team. Whenever she has a chance, she tries to make sure everyone is okay and having fun. Even if she's going off of information and data, it shows that she is caring and thoughtful. From that point forward, she does a bunch of goofy things, but it's all in an endearing way. From sneaking into Makoto's room to be with him, or telling some bad jokes she probably learned from Junpei. I see. So this is what you would call a harem, correct? According to my data, every single man in the world fantasizes of having one. She makes the whole game and squad more lively, and she's one of the best parts of the game for sure in my opinion. Reload added a lot of really great scenes with Aegis in the hangout events in the dorm, but one of my favorites with Aegis are the ones where you tend props with her. Through these moments, Aegis shows great interest and desire to learn more about life. After seeing the crops thrive and grow, and learning how living things can harmonize to grow together, it strengthens her heart and power of persona. Small steps like this go a long way in making Aegis more human as the game goes on. The next fairly important moment for Aegis as a character would be the next full moon operation on August 6th. Now there isn't too much development for her exactly, but it does give some insight. When Shrega makes their appearance, everyone is shocked for valid reasons. I mean, a random group of people sneak up on you during the dark hour where no one is supposed to be conscious. And not only that, they then question their values and morals regarding personas and the dark hour itself. A number of them get emotional as a result, especially after being closed in the bunker, but Igus on the other hand is the first to emphasize the point of them being there, and that they should focus on the shadow. This is a good example of the point I made earlier when I brought up the Chariot Arcana. She was solely focused on defeating the enemy in her way and wasn't bothered by emotions whatsoever, which might explain why her persona is the Chariot while Igus herself is only the Eon much later in the story. In the game, that's more or less it, but in the movie, Aegis plays a very big role during this fight. Once Strega closes them in the bunker, there's toxic gas that affects everyone except her, and as Makoto is about to be attacked by the Justice Arcana, Aegis steps in to protect him. While holding back their fuse form, she activates Orgia mode and performs some really impressive feats and almost takes it down on her own, but she overheats in the worst possible moment. Thankfully, Shinji appears to free them and disperse the toxic gas, giving the rest of the team the opening to finish off the shadows. After the battle, Makoto checks up on her, and they have a really cute moment together. <laughs> like I said, they are very similar in a lot of ways, and while these moments are extremely adorable, they also serve as some of the most important moments for her as well. With these full moon operations and time together, she becomes closer and closer to Makoto and the others. And as I keep reiterating since it's so vital to her, it gives her better understanding of humans and emotions. I won't go over every single moment they spend together because it would become redundant, but just know there's many moments like this. Skipping forward to September 2nd, quite a big jump I know. Aegis is enrolled in Gekokan High, the school Makoto and the others go to. She's in the same home room as him as well and she makes her feelings very clear for the rest of the world to see. The spot is perfect. My highest priority is to be with him at all times. Her enrolling in school was decided so that she could observe and learn more about humans, and that's exactly what ends up happening over time. But it's a gradual ordeal. That's not the only important thing to come from this, but that's something for a bit later. Not too long after, in the movies, Igis and the others have a discussion of what would happen to her in the case of the Dark Hour disappearing and she gives a very blunt answer here that is quite grim to me. Shadow 
もしかしたら停止させられちゃうかもしれないってことその可能性は十分にあるでしょうなんか寂しいね This moment with Aegis in particular really shows how she sees herself. Despite being an important and valued part of the team, she just doesn't have the capability to see herself as anything more than a machine designed to accomplish a task at this point in the story. And this is also shown after the next full moon on September 5th. In the movie, after they defeat the Shadow, Makoto lets his doubts about ending the Dark Hour slip out, and Shinji furiously confronts him about it. Aiga steps in to protect him since that's her highest priority, and everything with Shinji happens, but that's for another video. What's important here is what happens the following night in the dorm. Aegis enters Makoto's room while he's conflicted about everything going on, and Makoto asks a short and brutal question, at which point Aegis gives an answer in a similar vein. Now, skipping even further ahead to October 4th is where I believe one of the most important moments, not just for Aegis, but the entirety of Cease occurs. Now, if you're wondering why I'm skipping between dates so far, it's because Aegis really is just emotionless like this throughout a fair bit of Persona 3. She's still a great character all the way through, there just isn't too much to analyze without it becoming redundant. It's only after a lot of trials and tribulations between herself and Cease that she grows into her own, and that's what we're building towards. With that said, October 4th is probably the most well-known full moon in the game. As Aegis and the others fight the Strength and Fortune Arcanas, Ken and Shinji are nowhere to be seen, and that's because they're off having a very not pleasant conversation amongst one another. After they defeat it, one thing leads to another, and Shinji is shot by Takaya twice in an attempt to keep Ken out of harm's way. Aegis doesn't say a word, but she doesn't need to. Just seeing this acts as her first steps to growing as an actual person and not just a machine. Through everyone's grief and emotions around her, it actually affects her a lot. She might not show it and she might not realize it yet, but the death of Shinji and everyone's responses would grow to become cumbersome for her emotionally over time. I guess never had a true understanding of how the death of someone close could affect people, especially since she never saw herself as grievable since she could be replaced in her eyes, but this event showed her the reality of it. Huh? <laughs> what the hell's your problem? Shut up. <sighs> huh? What are you getting up for? I said shut the hell up! Over the following month, she has to see everyone in pain, and only with the thought that the next full moon would be the last can she, and everyone else, feel some amount of closure. Well, come November 3rd, the supposed end of the Dark Hour arrives, but they come across Shrega yet again before they fight the Hanged Man Arcana. They spout their beliefs and whatnot again, and after being defeated, Takaya and Jin jump off Moonlight Bridge together. They go on to defeat the Hanged Man Arcana, and in typical Aegis fashion, she makes a great victory cheer alongside Makoto and the others. Leader, I believe a celebration is in order. What will be our victory cheer? One, two, three, hip hip hooray! Hip hip hooray? Hip hip hooray! Hip hip hooray! The following night, they decide to have a celebration party hosted by Mitsuru's father to commemorate their efforts in defeating the Dark Hour. Shortly after the party begins, in the movie, Aegis and Makoto have a chat together. Aegis is not Ikutsuki-san,すべての作戦が終了しても、私の機能を停止しないと言ってくれました。誠さんやゆかりさんがお願いしてくれたおかげです。今から各部点検のため、一時ラボに戻りますが、すぐに帰還する予定です。ご心
Ikutsuki wants to bring upon the fall and reveals all of the shadows they've defeated thus far have only aided in his endeavor, and it's unavoidable now. After some back and forth, Ikutsuki orders Aegis to sacrifice all of them for the fall, but she refuses. Thinking back on everything they've done together, everything they've gone through together, she feels true emotion for the first time. Fear, hesitation. After learning everything she knows about bonds, human emotions, love, and hearing everyone's cries and seeing the looks on their faces, she goes completely against her given orders and not only refuses to kill everyone, but to free them instead. No longer would she blindly follow the orders she's been given, but only the ones she herself believes is right. Now doesn't this sound eerily similar to a certain someone she's been trying to protect this whole time? Makoto and Aegis have very similar struggles, albeit in different contexts and situations. Makoto dealing with the loss of his parents led him to become basically lifeless inside, and it also led to him blindly following orders once he obtained his persona, but he always had care for others. Over time, after becoming closer to everyone, he broke out of his shell and fought on his own terms for those he loved. I guess on the opposite side of the coin basically experienced the same thing. Being a robot, she was more or less lifeless at first despite having a persona and sense of self, but once she had a chance to see Makoto again, she reactivated herself. And through spending time with him and the very same friends that brought life back to him, the very same conundrum occurred for Aegis. Not all is okay though. Despite Aegis rebelling against her orders, Mitsuru's dad was a casualty after giving his life to stop Ikutsuki by shooting him, but in the process he was shot back. He vowed to stop the Dark Hour even if it cost him his life, which was unfortunately what occurred. After the previous events, everyone in Cease is shocked and unsure of what's to come, and this includes Aegis. The only thing she knows is the thing she's known all along, and it's that she wants to continue being by Makoto's side. Aegis continues to become more and more human, and this is very clear by how her attitude begins to change. The things she brings up and the things she says are uncharacteristic for her, at least at this point in the story. She still sees herself as more or less a machine designed to exterminate shadows, but her feelings toward it are much more complicated than before. In the movie, immediately after the last full moon and still damaged, she goes out on her own on a hunch of a bad premonition to see Makoto. She's actually very happy to see him, and with no hesitation, she says to him, through just this scene, you can really see how she's beginning to change. Her face is much more full of light. Most other moments she has, her face is deadpan, but from this point forward, her facial expressions are becoming indistinguishable from that of an actual human. She demonstrates happiness, fear, anger, and all the emotions a human possesses. She may not quite understand what's happening, but even she can tell something is different about herself, although she wouldn't open up about it until a bit later. Once Ryoji comes along, she is very suspicious of him, and in retrospect, we know why. He's the one Aegis fought 10 years ago on Moonlight Bridge. And since her main goals are to protect Makoto and defeat Shadows, Ryoji poses the biggest threat in the entire game to her. She can't do anything about it because she doesn't remember who Ryoji is, but this feeling sticks with her all the way until the next full moon. Until then, Aegis continues to have her goofy moments, demonstrated in scenes like the Kyoto trip several times over. Whether it be her lying fully submerged in the hot springs, or giving Makoto his first true laugh with the help of Junpei and Ryoji ironically, she's always bringing good and positive energy to the game and the friend group without even trying to do so. And she does this while dealing with those internal struggles I've previously mentioned. On the dark hour of November 22nd, everyone detects Shrega outside of Tartarus, and Chidori is detected to be among them. Junpei is the first to rush over there and gets attacked as a result. Chidori is afraid of getting close to Junpei, so she tries to kill him, but she realizes that's not what she wants. They make their peace together, but Junpei gets shot and killed, and Chidori then sacrifices her life to save him. Junpei awakens to his new power and mourns for Chidori's death thereafter. This moment isn't big for Aegis herself, but it does lead to a small moment involving her that I want to show. A little less than a week later, they recover Chidori's sketchbook, and inside is a portrait she drew of Junpei. This helps Junpei cope and recover from the tragedy, and Aegis clearly understands the significance of what this means. Before she became independent and decided to make her own choices in the fight against Akutsuki, 
she would have been able to discern the emotional state of Junpei the way she does. In a piece of dialogue immediately following the scene, she says, The recovery of Junpei-san's mental health has been confirmed. But then she says that sounded strange and tries to reword it as, I have confirmed that Junpei-san's mental state has returned to normal. Small moments in dialogue like this are what add up in the big picture for Igis and a lot of the other members of Cease as well. Like I said before, she never would have second guessed the way she words things before, but as she becomes more emotionally aware and proficient over the game, it becomes a bigger point of concern for her. Eventually, not too far from the next full moon, Ryoji visits the dorm to hang out with Junpei, and on his way out, Igis makes her appearance. Honestly, I think this entire moment is vital to Igis, so I'm just gonna let the majority of it play out. Hmm? What's up, ai -chan? I'm fine. It's just... I envy you, Junpei. I'm a machine. So I don't understand what it feels like to live. Really? But you don't seem that different. In my case, it's more accurate to say that I'm operational as opposed to alive. There are times when I malfunction, but I can always be repaired. Well, if we were all like you, then we never have to worry about dying. The gift of life is not something I should possess. A weapon is much more difficult to operate when it's alive. That said, I believe I understand the concept of loss. Leader, the thought of something happening to you, it makes me... Understood. You are very special to me. I can't explain why, but I never want to leave your side. I want to protect you at all costs, to be there for you always. What is this unsettling feeling? I am a machine. I can't die, so no one will have to grieve for me. I have to do something. I don't want to see them suffer anymore. This moment demonstrates everything I've been talking about thus far. Initially, her role as a machine didn't bother her, but now she would go as far to say she envies Junpei because he has a better understanding of what living is in her eyes. What Junpei says in response is true about her not being much different, but her view of herself as just a machine continues to hold her back from seeing herself as something more. She demonstrates fear, sadness, affection, confusion, and all these complex emotions living beings hold, yet she says she shouldn't possess these qualities of life because she's a machine. It's a really tough position she's in at this point because her feelings are all over the place. Should she just ignore what she feels about herself and Makoto to solely focus on her initial purpose as an anti-shadow weapon? Or should she explore what she's feeling and venture into an unknown realm of possibilities? Well, considering the fact that being a machine is all she's ever known, come the dark hour, she resolves to fight death yet again. After regaining her memories, fate has brought her to the same place everything began for her 10 years ago. And despite her feelings, she tries to fulfill her mission as an anti-shadow weapon, demonstrating the choice she resolved. The fight begins, and she tries her best, but... Sorry. I can't carry out my mission. I'm a machine. I can't fulfill its purpose. I have no reason. I'm sorry, everyone. I'm so sorry. I'm scared. Even in this fight, after making her choice, she can't hide from her feelings. Even though according to her, she can't die and she can't be mourned for, in the face of death, loss, and failure, she can't help but feel scared. After everyone else arrives, they're worried for her because of course they are. They see one of their best friends destroyed and she stops functioning altogether shortly after. She's taken to the lab for repairs and while she's there, a lot of developments happen. Everyone continues to worry for her and it's also revealed that Ryoji is the harbinger of the fall. And after defeating the 12 shadows during the dark hour, they have brought death fully together. The fall will commence by next spring, but if they kill Ryoji, they can forget everything until then. They have to make up their decision by December 31st, and everyone struggles to make their mind up. Eventually though, through much hesitation and struggle, everyone does come to the agreement to fight Nyx. That is except for Igis. Once she's repaired and returns, everyone is ecstatic, but she still tries to go on the narrative that she's just a machine and can be rebuilt. She's been caught up to date on the whole situation, and something extremely ironic occurs here. Despite calling herself a machine, 
one that I will keep reiterating that was designed to defeat and destroy shadows, is the only one that wants to kill Ryoji, the ultimate shadow itself. Out of everyone sitting in that lounge, she's the most emotionally unstable. She is terrified of seeing everyone she loves suffer, but through conversing with everyone, she comes to an important realization that I've been leading up to this entire video. Through everyone's love, comfort, and care, she realizes that her not having a life doesn't change anything at all. She might not see herself as being able to fulfill her original purpose, but it doesn't matter. And at this point, I think just letting her and everyone speak for themselves will get this moment across better than I ever could. So what is my purpose now? I just don't know, and no one can give me an answer. Well, yeah, you don't have the answers. The meaning of life or death isn't something someone else can just teach you. Making your own decisions is hard, no matter who you are. No choice is perfect, you know? But as long as we're alive, we gotta do something. When you see someone going through the same thing you're going through, you just want to help them. That's how we plan on getting through this. <laughs> Maybe that wasn't the best explanation, but that's the idea. That's... the idea? When I saw you collapse, I realized something. I want to protect you, I guess. I don't want to forget about you. Fuka-san. There are times when you'll lose sight of your purpose and you'll have to search for it. But if you can't find it again, then what you need is to seek out a new purpose. I'm not really one to talk, but I feel like I've learned something important this year. To truly live is to be willing to change. And we have to make those choices for ourselves. Do you think I'll be able to change too? You have changed so much. Haven't you noticed? You've even started speaking like a real human. I understand what my purpose is now. I'm a machine with the directive to live. And the one issuing this new command is me. I'll stare fear in the face and choose to live. This is the promise I've made to myself. I'm not sure how I'll do it. But perhaps that's a part of living too. Yeah. It sure is. And in this moment, her original persona, Palladian, evolves from the machine donning the characteristics of a human it once was, to a human in the form of Athena, the Greek goddess of wisdom, warfare, and handicraft. I know goddess and human are oxymorons here, but I think it gets my point across here. Athena alongside the aforementioned details was also seen as a warrior goddess that would lead soldiers into battle. While she currently isn't the leader of the group, she would soon come to be after the journey, but I'm getting ahead of myself at this point. Palladian and Athena have a lot of similarities actually. They were both seen as protectors of Greece, and there was even a Palladium, or Palladian, made of Athena that is said to be carved by Athena herself. This is actually a perfect representation of Aegis because she went from the persona Palladian, that was a machine with the mask of a human as I've been saying, to Athena, the Greek goddess, and she carved this path for herself with the help of her friends and the experiences she went through. I really like this awakening because Aegis and the things she fights for don't change too much, but the reason she fights changes completely. She's always had the directive to defeat shadows, but instead of doing it because it's what she's been directed to do, she does it because it's what she herself believes in doing. She fights to protect her friends, to love, and to live, not just because it's the only thing she's ever known, but because it's what she decided upon. Oh, also, Athena's shield is literally called an Aegis, so if that isn't the most obvious sign she lives to protect those close to her, then I don't really know what would. There's more I want to talk about regarding Athena and her mythology, but I think it's best saved until the answer segment of this video begins. Now that Aegis has awakened to Athena and found her true sense of self, that also means I can go into her social link too. It becomes available on January 8th, and it's one of the best social links in the game in my opinion and it leads all the way up to the promised day against Nyx, so it works out well for the purposes of this video. Though so Aegis's social link is her coming to terms with her newfound resolve, trying to better understand both her feelings and other people's feelings, and trying to come to terms that despite being a machine, she's no less human than anyone else. Rankin starts this off well because she brings up how Korobaru would stand by the shrine waiting for his master, despite the fact he had passed away. 
She didn't understand why before, but after developing true feelings of her own, she sees the truth of the matter. It sets things up and it's a sign of things to come, especially since Koromaru himself also isn't human. Rank 2 shows off her growth pretty well in my opinion. Makoto and Aigis go to the school rooftop, and she mentions that she prefers the view from there over even Yakushima because of her emotions. Before she wouldn't have cared, but since she actually has a human heart, these things matter more to her now, and this unfamiliarity is scary to her sometimes, but she says that if she can change alongside Makoto, then she can cherish these memories and feelings. She's beginning to understand the small things in life, and it's a great intro to what the social link will focus on, just like Rank 1. In Rank 3, her conflict of being a machine with feelings really begins to show. After a pack of dogs get angry at her over a misunderstanding, they try to bite her, but get hurt because of her steel body. She feels like she has nowhere to belong since she's in between this weird middle ground of human and a machine. In Rank 4, Makoto and Aigis go in search of an old lady's missing cat, and when they can't find it, she's as hard on herself as ever. She calls herself useless, and her internal conflict is still troubling her. In Rank 5, they search for the cat again and they actually do manage to find it this time. They return it to the old lady, and Aigis gets some insight from the old lady about loneliness. She says that people can't live by themselves, and this hits close to home for Aigis, since she holds Makoto very dear to her heart. Still though, she feels like since she doesn't have a human body, she might not be able to fully fulfill that, since she can't truly connect with people. In rank 6, the old lady is being haggled by her grandson, and Aigis thinks back on what the old lady said about being lonely. She goes and talks to the boy to try and understand why he does what he does. Safe to say she doesn't get the answer she's expecting since the dude gives an answer along the lines of living means to have a blast and have fun, which is a far cry from what she herself believes. After hearing the answer, he tries to ask her out, but she just tells Makoto they should go, which leads to him storming off angrily. She doesn't understand why, which upsets her. In my playthrough, I chose the option he thought I was your boyfriend because that's clearly what the case was. And she says a literal definition of boyfriend, but afterwards she gets flustered, showing clear interest in Makoto. She then talks about how ever since she wanted to live, she's had more and more questions, but she can't ever find the answer to why she's not alive, and that frustrates her. She might be jealous of humans for their ability to touch and feel, but despite that, she recognizes she's fortunate to be where she is, and it shows she's slowly beginning to understand things better. In rank 7, the old lady's cat has gone missing again and Aigis is happy and ready to help her find her again, but then she says that won't be necessary since it had gone in search of something, at which point Aigis is unsure what that means. Well, the old lady explains that the cat might be near the end of its life, and is trying to find its resting place. Aigis gets worried for the old lady since she's lonely, but she reassures it's all for the best. As the old lady walks away, Aigis says, You're not alone. I'm certain of it. Afterward, she asks questions like, was the cat happy? Was it happy to be born? What purpose was it born for? And many hard-hitting questions along those lines, showing her uncertainty about these aspects of even herself. She understands living is about connecting with others, but the fact that people are destined to part eventually saddens her. She then asks if she and Makoto will have to part eventually, which is, uh, you know, but then she says, I do want to live, but that's not the only thing. I... It's not just about becoming more human, it's about you, being with you. So clearly, Aigis loves Makoto, and slowly she's realizing that her reason for living is to be by his side. Not so different from her initial motive of reactivating, but much more human of a motive this time around. In rank 8, Aigis and Makoto go to the rooftop, and she recognizes that she's becoming more human as they spend time together. She feels as though her human heart cannot function without a human body though. She then asks if he's been up there with anyone else, showing she's jealous and wants to be with him. And I personally chose the option, I'm doing it now. But yet again, she tries to reiterate that she's not a real human, despite blushing like one would. She's worried that hanging around Makoto would cause problems since she's seen as a human girl, which could theoretically make a girl he's interested in jealous or angry. I chose the option, I don't mind you being here. And rather than acknowledging it, she brings up how couples come up there sometimes to embrace and all that, which hurts her, since she feels like she can't have this connection to people. She asks him why she's so important to him, and in my playthrough, I said it's love, which makes her understand what her desire is aside from living. On rank 9, they go to the rooftop again, and Aigis points out how the view is never the same day to day, and the same goes for lives in people's own day to day. She mentions how the promised day is closing in, and it's got her thinking a lot. 
She's thinking about her feelings, the old lady, the cat, and all these things. She brings up the fact that Makoto and herself will have to part ways one day, which again is, you know, but this thought really makes her sad. But then she says, But I understand now. That's just how it is. Life is both short and finite. That's what makes it so invaluable and why one feels that it must be cherished. I believe that's why we find happiness in forging bonds and relationships with others. And that might be the true joy of being alive. It can be sad, but at the same time so warm. Beautiful because it is destined to end. So she finally truly understands the beauty of forging bonds with other people and why people decide to do it despite the fact they'll have to part one day. It's not so much a sad prospect, but it's more so a beautiful thing that brings joy to being alive. And because of this, she finds the courage to express her love to Makoto. Now, I did not have the heart to turn her down when she said I love you, but regardless of whether you do or not, it's kind of besides the point that's being shown to her for her character development. The main focus is what I mentioned before about her truly understanding and coming to terms with her feelings and understanding of bonds and life despite not being totally human. Now finally, rank. 10. Going off the romantic route since that's the one I experienced, she invites you to her dorm room, and she's a bit embarrassed of her room since it doesn't reflect who she is anymore. She may be a machine, but this doesn't bother her at all. In fact, since she's a machine and in love with Makoto, she can confidently say she won't ever leave his side. And with her saying that, her social link is wrapped up. She's not trying to deny she's a machine, but she understands it doesn't matter anymore. As long as she can fulfill the things she wants to do, feel the emotions she wants to feel, and be with the person she wants to be with, then she'll be okay. That's what she decides for herself. Now with Igus's growth up to the promise day more or less complete, we can move into the judgment day against Nyx. Everyone has their will and resolve fully satisfied, and they're ready to win at any cost. In the movies, Makoto fights Nyx on his own, but I'm not going to focus on that point at all. There's just one moment in the movie I want to show before the final battle itself, and it's this piece of dialogue Igus gives in the battle against Shrega. And then in the game, as she fights Nyx alongside everyone else, she echoes similar sentiments. Now swapping back to the movie, after the fight with the Nyx where they failed to defeat him, everyone is taken off their feet by an immeasurable force and begin to get attacked by the shadows. Makoto is defenseless and almost gets overrun, but Igus with barely any strength left herself shoots the shadows to protect him, at which point she gets overrun, and this leads to Makoto awakening his ultimate persona in the form of the Messiah. Before he goes off to fight Nyx alone, he says one thing to Igus. After Makoto seals Nyx, everyone is despairing at the thought of him being gone, and Igus is no exception. She feels powerless and unable to protect the one she loves the most, and she calls out for him. Life's greatest question. Igus, you'll find the answer one day as well. Once Tartarus is destroyed, Nyx is defeated, and everyone returns outside the school safely, Igus is the first one to run and notice Makoto. Miraculously, Despite being a machine, she begins shedding tears because of this. After that, everyone's lives return to normal. Everyone forgets the memory of the Dark Hour since it's been destroyed. And this actually does include Igus. In the Persona 3 manga, they show that after the Dark Hour had been destroyed, she knew what her purpose was and why she was built, but she had no idea why she was in the dorm. Her last memory was that of being in stasis in Yakushima, and she knows that she's enrolled in school despite not belonging there, yet she goes anyway knowing something important lies ahead. Eventually, on March 4th, Makoto and Igus cross paths as fate would have it, and they both remember everything. The way the manga shows this side of Igus is amazing, and I just knew I had to mention it in this analysis once I saw it for the first time. So finally, March 5th, the promised day arrives. The day they all agree to meet up on the school rooftop to celebrate the fight against Nyx. While everyone else is at the graduation ceremony, since Igus and Makoto have their memories back already, they get ahead of everyone and meet there alone. And honestly, I really want to let this entire scene play by itself, but I'll summarize a bit of it just to save some time. So Igus talks about how she finally found her reason to live. She says to live is to follow your heart. 
fighting for what you can change, and accepting the things you can't. She says every life will one day fizzle out, but once you come to terms with it, what matters becomes clear, and it gives your life meaning. She then goes into the point I've been making about how her order has always been to protect people, but she eventually decided that this is what she wanted to do for herself anyway all along, and she realized it when she thought about how she might never see Makoto again. In that moment, she found out what mattered most to her, and that is to protect Makoto from now until the end of time, and to stay by his side forever. Despite knowing she's not the only one that could do this, that's what she decided she wants to do. She decides that if she does it for Makoto, then nothing is a waste, and her life will have meaning. After saying that, she begins crying, at which point Makoto consoles her. And I'm now going to let her finish off my summary. I see it now. I have friends. We support each other through thick and thin. Not everything needs to be for some greater purpose. Just caring about someone can be enough. That's all we need to give our lives meaning. As for me, I found my path. And that's to protect you with my life. Thank you so much for everything. You must be tired. Go ahead and rest now. I'll be right here. I won't be going anywhere. In a moment, the others will be joining us. It's really easy to see why her reason to live is extremely heartbreaking to hear. Moments after she says these things to the Makoto, and as everyone he loves is around him, he passes away. In the eyes of Igus and Cease, the reason for death is a mystery, and this is something that would haunt them. They knew the risks of fighting Nyx, but having him pass away wasn't something the majority of the group could exactly cope with very well, especially Igus. I mean, Igus' entire growth throughout the journey depended on Makoto almost entirely. Really think about this for a moment and put yourself in the shoes of Aegis right now. The person you've put your entire life's meaning into is now dead, and you don't even know exactly why. The person that helped you in your darkest moments, and made you who you are, is just gone without warning. This isn't to say that the other members of Seas didn't get hard either, but Aegis? I mean, good god, I couldn't even imagine what she was feeling. And this allows me to segue into the next chapter of Aegis' character, The Answer. The answer is a bit divisive amongst Persona 3 fans, but I really love how they handled it overall personally. Aside from the gameplay of course, good god, but that's besides the point. The answer takes place on March 31st, 26 days after Makoto's passing. Everyone is hurting badly as I mentioned before, and Aegis' character has a moment of regression. Since she has essentially lost her meaning to life, she's also lost her will to live. As they group up everyone's evokers on the last day of Ming in the dorm, Igus reveals she's going to be returning herself to the lab, and she will not be returning to school next semester. She says it's for the purpose of finding her own way in life, but to be honest, even on my first playthrough of the answer, I wasn't convinced. It just seems so out of character for her to do this after her development in the journey. The same night they have a party together and have sushi, but Akihiko and Yukari are absent since they had gym and cram practice respectively. Once the time hits midnight though, something strange happens. The time reverts back to the beginning of March 31st, as if they're in a time loop. They don't think much of it at first, so Igus returns to her room, and she begins thinking of the last moment she spent with Makoto. Igus herself says that after his passing, she fell into a depression, and started having recurring nightmares after that. In said nightmares, she would continue to run for Makoto, but she can never catch him. She then recalls the promise she made to him, and how it was her reason for living, but now it's going to go unfulfilled. She then says that one day her sadness was gone, the dream stopped, and she didn't need sleep anymore. And she also asks herself if she can continue to live like this. And at this point I knew my initial suspicions were correct. 
no one with nothing to regret would have this kind of thing happen. And I really cannot blame her at all. Makoto was the one thing she had in this world in her eyes aside from the rest of Seas. But Makoto was truly special to her, and now he's gone. It's clear that through these words, she's regressed back into a mostly emotionless machine as a coping mechanism. The fascinating thing about this is that in the Persona 3 movies, Makoto has a very similar problem. After Shinji's death, he became a shell of himself and shut himself in from others to avoid being hurt, and now Aegis is doing the same thing. Moments after these thoughts go through her mind, a loud bang is heard from downstairs, and Fuka alerts her of a new enemy. As she goes down to the lobby, everyone's been hurt, and a machine the same model as Aegis is the culprit. She's known as Metis, and she's allegedly trying to protect Aegis, and to do that, she has to get rid of everyone else. Apparently, cause that makes total sense without context, thank you Metis. They begin to fight, and Aegis does something that to this day, no other Persona character has been able to do. Metis basically one-shots Aegis and almost kills Ken, but as Aegis is about to shut down, she recalls Makoto in her mind, and she refuses to go down. Not only does she refuse to go down, but she transforms Athena into Orpheus, who is Makoto's main persona. I guess went from a normal party member bound by her single persona to transforming herself into a wild card. Now, honestly, I think this is one of the most insane and impressive feats in this entire series. She defeats Metis with no issue after that, and gets transported to the Velvet Room, where she's made aware of her new power, and this power is a means to find her own answer to life just as Makoto did. She questions if this new power and the answer at the end of one's journey would lead to death, at which point she says how that possibility doesn't even bother her at this point. It really is insane how many parallels there are between Makoto and herself. I mean, Makoto and Aegis' journeys at this point are in complete reverse. Makoto began as an emotionless man at the beginning of his journey that cared not at all about the possibility of death, but at the end he gave his life to save those he held dear. Now, Aegis finds herself in a similar fate but only at the end of his journey and then the start of her own. Now she herself has little care for life or death and has been bestowed the same power in the same way as well to protect someone else. So do you remember how I had some more things I wanted to explain about Athena during her initial awakening scene? Well, now's the time. In Greek mythology, Metis was the mother of Athena. Zeus, the father of Athena and husband of Metis, had a premonition that the child they would bear would become strong enough to overthrow him, so he tried to prevent this by swallowing Metis whole, but she was already pregnant with Athena at this point. Once Zeus swallowed Metis, he began to have headaches and called upon one of his blacksmiths to open his head, and once he did so, Athena emerged. Athena basically inherited the many qualities from Metis including her wisdom, knowledge, and things of this nature. Her emerging from Zeus's head also symbolizes and associates Athena with the aforementioned qualities that she would become famous for in the mythology. In the context of Persona, you could essentially see Metis as being Aegis's shadow in a sense. She wasn't trying to harm Aegis at all. Actually the opposite in fact. She was trying to protect her no matter what, even if it meant she would be hated for it. The reason she came and attacked Ken and the others in the first place is because she thought they were the reason the Abyss of Time was formed, which came to be because of the grief Cease had experienced following Makoto's death. Her sole purpose for existing is to protect Aegis, and she loathes the thought of being alone. Sounds quite familiar, eh? Well, there's more to their connection than even that, but first we need to go over the Abyss of Time. As the story of the answer develops, everyone has shown a door to their past, and these doors reflect the events that eventually led to them awakening their power of persona, and Aegis' door is the last one they view. Her door doesn't reflect her awakening to Palladian or Athena though, it reflects the moment she awakened to the power of the wild card, and this moment was the recurring dream mentioned earlier. She wished to be returned to a mere machine, and that's what happened, and this emptiness allowed her to awaken the wild card. Moments later, Seas comes face to face with the source of all the regrets, and that figure is none other than Makoto himself. They regret what happened to him, and they don't want time to progress, and they can't accept losing him, and that's what made the abyss of time appear in the first place. After learning about this and having defeated the shadow in the form of Makoto, they are given two options. They can open the dorm entrance and continue their lives as they normally would, or they can go back in time before Makoto seal Nyx. Well, there's a few problems here. Everyone has a key they need to use, and they all have to use them at once on one single option. Not only that, but they're running out of time to make their decision, and to top it all off, no one can fully agree on what they should do. They all decide to fight each other to see who gets all the keys, and there are a few nice moments of dialogue I think are important. After Akihiko, Ken, Junpei, and Koromaru have been defeated, Metis and Aegis have this conversation. I don't want you to die and leave me behind. 
rather give my life and be alone. That way, I can always stay with you. What are you saying? Please don't leave me behind! <sighs> it's okay. I'm sorry. I won't leave you. I... thought I knew all too well the pain of being left behind. You show me so many things that I'd let myself forget. I guess... Because our bonds are so strong, there's no solution to this where no one gets hurt. There's no easy way out. If I gave up without making a decision, I'd be running away from the pain my friends must still face. I think... I was running away from life again. I need to make a choice. I care about him as much as anyone else. With this conversation between themselves, I guess realizes what she's been doing and resolves to make an answer on which door to open, although she doesn't know which one she's going to until she gets all the keys. What she does know though is that she's going to stop running from the past in her life and make a decision at the end. After the last conversation and during the fight against Yukari and Mitsuru, she regained that humanity her voice and emotion had been lacking ever since the death of Makoto. Loss can hurt, but I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I too have something important. That's why I'm willing to fight you two now. Once she obtains the true key, the one that can open either of the doors, she resolves that she's not going to make her choice until she sees the truth of what happened to him. That's been the one thing haunting her and the rest of Cease this whole time, and unless she finally gets closure on that, she cannot make her decision. They're able to do so by going through the final door of memories, which shows them the truth. He sealed Nyx and protected from the will of the masses who wished for her to make her appearance back onto the earth. Countless people wish for this, and Igus was one of them for a time. Last December, I too wished to learn death. It's probably true that people in town are wishing to touch it somewhere in their hearts. There is only one thing that differentiates life from stillness. It's that we die. That's all there is. Cease decide to fight the monster and come out victorious. They debate whether it's possible for the monster to one day be fully destroyed, at which point the true Igus we all know and love says, No, I'm sure we can do it. We can all change someday. As long as we're alive, it can happen. After all, even I was able to do it. And after all of that, they open the entrance to the dorm to return things to how they should be, moving on forward and not regretting the past. So going back to the point I was making about Metis and Igus, it's revealed that Metis was the part of Igus that she had been denying throughout the events of the answer, the other Igus if you will. Since she wished to be a mere machine and got what she desired, Metis is the part of her that she wished away in physical form. She came to help Igus confront her pain and fear, and succeeded with flying colors. They recombine together, and Igus is back to who she truly is. No longer a mere machine, but a human machine. One with the ability to love, to cry, and all the other beautiful things humans are capable of. With Igus' journey now complete, she's found the answer to life just as he did, and just as was told to happen by Igor at the very beginning of the answer. But that prospect of her life coming to an end at the answer being revealed now crawls back into question. Will she suffer the same fate as the one she loved? Regardless of what the outcome may or may not be, she's satisfied with her life thus far. She's overcome losing Makoto, but she also wishes she hadn't regressed initially as she did. She missed his farewell and can't believe she had wished to be emotionless. Despite that, she's happy. Once they return to the dorm, it's now April 1st, showing they've overcome their regrets and stopped the abyss of time from existing any longer. Igus is unresponsive, and once they do an analysis on her, it's revealed that she overloaded due to her ability of the wild card, and if they repair what's been damaged, then she won't be the Igus they know anymore. Well, it turns out Igus just has that dog in her, and despite being burned out and damaged, she wakes up just fine. She shouldn't even be able to function at all, but with her newfound resolve, she's more human than ever. She has no need for something as trivial as that at this point. The next morning, after everyone is rested up, Igus asks Mitsuru if she can back out of going back to the lab, since she only made that decision when she was trying to run away from her life and the truth. She wants to return to school and experience life alongside everyone, and learn new things about the world. 
Mitsuru cancels the transfer, and as everyone is leaving the dorm for the final time, Yukari offers to be her roommate, saying they're friends. With Aegis now accepting the loss of Makoto, learning not to run away from her life and her emotions, finding her answer to life, and resolving to live alongside everyone once again, her character arc is now complete. To be honest, I think Aegis' character arc hits even harder for me than Makoto himself did. Aegis, despite being a machine, is easily one of the most human characters in the series to me, and I have so much love and respect for her, it's unreal. Going from a heartless machine, designed solely for the task of defeating shadows, to having a complex human heart forged by those she loves and holds dear, and finally to finding her answer to life after so much pain, regret, and fear, I really think she embodies the entire point of Persona 3. Regardless of what happens in life, and whatever setbacks you might have, as long as you have bonds with those you love and hold dear, you can eventually find your answer to life and live for what you desire. The end of the answer might not hit as hard as the end of the journey, but to be honest, I find myself getting just as emotional regardless, and so many questions run through my mind. Are there things in my past I've been running away from? How would I act in the shoes of C centering the answer? What can I do to become the person I want to be? I'll be honest with you guys, and this is a little hard to admit, but there have been times in my life where I might have wished for Nyx to return as well. In my earlier teenage years, I wasn't very well off mentally, let's just say that. And seeing Igus run away from her past and eventually come to terms with everything gutted me emotionally. I honestly think in retrospect, playing the answer might have changed my life for the better. And maybe that's why I hold it in such a higher regard than some people do. The basis of it felt so real and human despite being supernatural, and I can't really explain how I feel about it all that well. Back on the topic of Igus herself, I think the choices for her two initial personas, Palladian and Athena, were actually perfect, and I don't think there's any two figures that would better represent her journey as a character. I've said it many times, but going from a machine donning the characteristics of a human to a goddess that more accurately resembles a human is just way too perfect for her, and it's a great representation of who she is by the end of the journey, and the answer. In the answer, when she awakens to the wild card, it really shows how empty she was at that point. In my eyes, the wild card has always been an ability for those who are empty inside. Makoto Yuki, Aigis, Yunarakami, and Renamamiya, all these wielders of the wild cards had some sort of emptiness inside of them for one reason or another, and through the bonds they forged throughout the game, they managed to change the course of history for the sake of the ones they loved. Aigis' writing is just so damn interesting because of how, as I said before, she's the only one to eventually awaken to the wild card and not have it from the start. It's such an interesting detail, and I think it really makes Aegis one of, if not the most interesting characters in the Persona franchise. Not only that, but her parallels between Makoto are just masterfully written in my opinion. They have such similar struggles and fates, yet it feels so different at the same time. I don't know how they managed to do it, but damn they outdid themselves. Honestly though, I feel like I've said my piece about Aegis plenty at this point, and we know how far she came as a person. From an emotionless machine to one of the most complex humans in the series. What do you all think though? Did you like Igus as a character and protagonist? Did you like or dislike the answer? I want to hear what you all have to say, so just like the Makoto analysis, I'm going to reply to every single comment on this video. I love hearing what you all have to say, and responding to the comments was one of my favorite parts of making the last analysis. I'm sure to have missed some details or gotten things wrong with how long this turned out, so feel free to correct me on anything if I'm wrong, or just feel free to give your insight on something anyway. With all of this said, I guess is a goaded character, and I love her. And I also love y'all. If you feel generous today, then consider dropping a like and a subscribe, but don't feel obligated to do so. I appreciate you all either way. It's been your boy Yandere Gogeta, and I will see y'all in the next video. Peace out, and have a great day.